Hey, this is Bradley Sowash, and today we're going to be talking about how to choose a fake book. To start us out, I'm just going to play some tunes using my favorite fake book and let a couple people drop in. Let's see, I'm going to whip through here in my old... Oh, here's Angel Eyes. Oh, that's a good one. Let's just flip through this fake book. Let's see. Oh, as time goes by. gig and I need another tune. I flip through looking for a familiar friend. Oh, here's a nice one, Black Orpheus. And let's do a couple more. Just seeing the, the utility of a face of a Facebook, of a fake book here. Here's Body and Soul. Just pull that up. the bees and look at a, uh, another part of the book here. Just see what comes up. Oh, easy living. This is a standard not many people know, but it's so pretty. Ah, one more. Just see what comes up if I flip through here that strikes me. Um, well, there's a ballad. Let's see if we can find something a little more up. Uh, oh, Girl from Ipanema. Everybody knows this one. So, first of all, what is a fake book? Um, some people um, may not even know about that. So, a fake book is a collection of lead sheets and um, just pulled together to allow a musician to fake it. So briefly, if you're not familiar with a lead sheet, it's just the melody with the chords written above. Just enough information to pull off the tune, but to do it in your own way. Without so many notes and a fully fleshed out accompaniment, it makes it possible to um, bring your own taste and personality to it and um, to use some of the stock styles you've learned and have moments of creativity, all things I teach in my online jazz piano classes and things that I've done my whole life. In fact, to be honest with you, even when I'm playing fully notated classical music, I fake it a little bit. I think most pianists do, especially when they're sight reading. You kind of digest that left hand and, and um, just play something that is similar to survive the choir, uh, you know, accompaniment that you're doing or similar. So a lead sheet, you know, has just that melody and um, chords above. Uh, I don't know, here's what just popped up here. A random page here on a clear day. You can see forever. So we just see the melody and um, some chords there. And then when you put them all together, you have a fake book. Because um, back before people were using more commonly the word improvise, they were saying fake it. Like the guy comes up to the band and says, do you know how to play, I don't know, all the things you are? And, um, and... And the band says, well, we haven't rehearsed that, but we will fake it. Um, so that a fake book then is a collection of lead sheets to help you be able to fake it. I just want to tell you a quick story about how I got involved with um, fake books. I soon realized when I was about 14 and 15, I started to play in bands around my hometown. And um, I played in rock and roll, but I was also doing some society gigs, we called them, where we're playing, you know, um, wedding receptions and things like that. And we needed some nice jazz and I didn't know a lot of tunes. So I went down to my local music store and I and where they sold sheet music and instruments and and uh and I asked the, the proprietor there if he could give me a fake book. And he said, We don't deal in fake books because they were illegal because they were collections of tunes that had not been cleared with the publisher and they were not copywritten and so it wasn't fair to, um, you know, photocopy and distribute 
other people's intellectual property. So uh, I didn't know what to do. I eventually scrounged up a fake book um, by borrowing it from somebody else who sort of forgot I had it. And you remember in those days, this was in the early 70s, it was kind of brand new that copy machines were available. You could put a quarter in at the library and make a copy. So there wasn't even the option to extend the illegality of playing intellectual property by making your own book. That was just coming in. So in 1983, I moved to New York City and everybody was playing from fake books and I needed to get a hold of one. And nobody would give theirs up to let me make a copy from it. So I went down to Manny's Music on 46th Street, and I asked the guy if he could uh, sell me a fake book. And again, I got that same answer. We don't deal in, you know, illicit materials. But then he said, if you come back about 6 p.m. and go to the front door, you, um, the, you, you may be able to find a way around that. What? Now, I'm, I'm a good guy, right? Most of you know me. I'm, a, I'm kind of pure as the driven snow in terms of my morality. And so when I came back, the guy said, uh, yeah, there was a guy there with a big briefcase. And, and he had a bunch of fake books. And he sold me an illegal fake book. In fact, the, the illegal fake book, the one I most needed, the real book, because that's what people were playing in New York City. And um, that was my first and only uh, illegal contraband illicit purchase as I got that essential book that enabled me to play gigs around New York City with um, bands. And the, the joke of that book is it's called The Real Book because it's kind of a play on words. It's, it's, a, it's a fake book. So we'll look at that in a minute. So I started out playing some tunes from my fake book. I'm going to give you a little um, tour of fake books so that you know which ones might be right for you. Um, and the first thing you're going to find when you when you go to find a fake book is you're going to go into a music store and you're going to find words with names like ultimate and and you know colossal and the one and only fake book you ever need. And I'm just going to share with you right now a few of my fake books. Move this over here and tilt the camera. I I started to put these out yesterday and it filled up my whole cart and I couldn't even put all my fake books there. So. Um, I've, over the years, accumulated quite a number of them, and um, the first ones you're going to find is, like I said, I just pulled out a couple of these. Here's one that says, Colossal Fake Book, more than a thousand songs. Wow. Okay, if I look in here, the problem is about 50% of the songs I've never heard of. The Hip Trolley, I don't know, you know, do you know these tunes, El Triste? Uh, a doll on a music box. Probably some of you know these, but there's just a lot of tunes in here I would never play. Um, and so let's go through that collection. Here's another one that says, The Ultimate Fake Book. The cover is long gone. Ultimate Fake Book, you know. And this one probably had more uh, tunes I recognized in it because I went through the contents and made a tick beside the tunes I could quickly pull up during a gig. So it had, you know, 20 songs out of a thousand that I could use. And, and um, let's just do some more. Here's the ultimate fake book number two, volume two, the ultimate fake book. 800 songs, it says. All right, so the reason that these colossal, ultimate, amazing, every song you ever wanted to know fake books are not, are not gonna be the only book you ever need is because the tunes in them are put out by a publisher who own the rights to those tunes. So no publisher has the rights to every tune. And, and so they're limited to what they can put on there. So essentially they go through their catalog, create lead sheets, and put them all together. That's useful, nothing wrong with that. It's just that don't expect to find a collection of tunes which really just suits all your needs and all you do is turn the page and you're on to the next tune. Just a couple more, because I think I get a hick uh, uh, a, a kick out of how they describe these. Here's the new bonus West Coast edition. All the shows, all the latest shows, the world's largest fake book, 620 pages, it says. And it's interesting that that's the world's largest because here is the world's greatest fake book. I'm not making this up. Um, so they all have uh, quite a lot of um, bravura and hyperbole going on. I think my English teacher would be happy about that, that I'm using those words. So, 
If you're just joining us, I'm Bradley. So watching today, we're talking about how to choose a fake book. And so far, we've just covered some of the colossal big ones, um, the ultimate books. Um, now, we can move on to jazz, my favorite topic. So I've been a jazz musician my whole life, and I've uh, been interested in getting my hands on tunes so that when, you know, when people came up with a request or just to learn the tunes, I needed a fake book with that tunes that I would likely to play in a jazz setting. Reminds me of the story of the, the sort of inebriated um, person who came up to the band on a gig one, one time, kind of irritated and said, do you know what kind of fool am I? And we all burst out laughing. That is a tune, but we can tell you're a fool, sir. Um, so anyway, initially and, and ongoingly, uh, we made our own fake books. So here is Our Love Is Here To Stay by Gershwin, handwritten, right? Handwritten for the band to, um, to play. Let's just, get, let's just get a little bit of that. Um, let's see. <laughs> here to stay the Gershwin um, classic and so we just made our own oh here's here's one you recognize played this on a lot of gigs um, uh, I'll just, just the introduction will show it to you Why would I know that Billy Joel tune deep in my heart and not need to look at that fake book? I haven't played it in 15 years, and, and, and there it is in our homemade fake book. And that's how bands have done it for a long time. The Glenn Miller Orchestra, you know, had a guy in charge of the book. They called it the book, and the, I'm sure it was the same for all the other big bands and, and um, early jazz where they were doing a mixture of reading and improvising. You know, so I had two books of this. We copied them, handed them out to the band. And, um, and put uh, bookmarks all over them. I'll just share that with you. The little fringe on top is some of the top tunes we had to whip open. Um, but then along comes the real book, which I talked about earlier. Now, the, the real book is a joke on the word fake book, as I said. And there's, it's kind of mysterious how the real book started. I've been playing from it in the beginning of this session. And there are various stories about how it started um, and... We just know it came out of Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Um, the story I always heard was that a professor there assigned tunes for students to figure out the chords and melody by ear and then hand in a lead sheet. That professor then compiled those lead sheets and gave it back to the class. And then they kind of leaked out in, into the gigging students that were playing around Boston at, in the 1970s. Another story I heard was that um, three musicians in particular um, Steve Swallow, Pat Metheny, and Gary Burton. Pat Metheny is the great jazz guitarist. Steve Swallow, a wonderful bassist. And Gary Burton is probably the greatest vibraphone player um, to ever walk the planet. And um, they said that they were, uh, you know, handing tunes back and forth to their student. And after a while, two students in particular who prefer to remain anonymous compiled those tunes and did it in such a nice, neat style of handwriting that it became the famous jazz font, which now notation programs imitate. Um, and th because this is the look of a handwritten lead sheet. Now, um, wh whether or not it started one way or the other, the point is when I was in New York City in the 80s, if you didn't have this book, you could not make a living. It was the set of tunes. Now, the funny thing about it was it isn't a particularly... Uh, curated set of tunes since it was kind of random. So there are tunes in there that are very, very jazz insider tunes. Um, tunes by Wayne Shorter, uh, you know, that are, are, are angular and obtuse and not the kind of thing that would probably get people on the dance floor at a wedding. And beside that is a tried and true, you know, standard like Girl from Ipanema that I was playing earlier. And so it's this weird collection of tunes that, that became worldwide the sort of standard book that jazz players knew simply because they could get a hold of it. And furthermore, the chords in it are 
not even always right. Whatever right chords mean in a lead sheet. That's a whole other topic about how what a composer writes and what people play can often be different. So if you're into jazz, you can still get the real book number one today. And it has to say the real book, not the new real book and, and things like that. Um, because Hal Leonard, the big publisher Hal Leonard, a couple of years ago, well, no longer than a couple now, went back and realized that um, people were needed the, this folk book, if you will. It started in a folky way, in a, a, a grassroots way. They needed it for gigs. So they went and cleared the rights with most of the tunes that happened to be randomly collected together by students in the real book and made their own version. So just let me show you. Here's my um, tattered real book, no cover. Um, oops, this one does have a cover, but pages falling out. It's been on hundreds of gigs in Europe, New York City, Columbus, Ohio. Um, here then is is a, a what's left of, a, of another part of it. Um, these are all various tattered editions of of the real book. Um, you know, just I don't know, just flipping through books is not that interesting. But eventually, um, oh, this one's good because it got wet. This one got completely underwater on on under a gig, and it's so it's extra fat, and the pages stick together. This is real book number two. Um, so eventually. Hal Leonard made it available, and it looks like this. They still use a, a kind of jazz font there. This is the a legal one. This is real book number two, and um, they now have six volumes of real books at Hal Leonard, as far as I know. Um, that's and they are they are a little neater. They're a little bit more consistent, and they're a little bit better chords. So. If you're into jazz and you want to play some tunes, you need to get the real book. And I want to let you know that I played the real book for years, just book one before I even knew, before I knew there was a book two. And so you don't need to go out and buy all six sets. You can just, you have a, you'd have a, a year or more of, of uh, tunes to play from of just real book one. And um, now it's legal and, and, you know, you can hit it. I'll just flip through here. Give an example, um, you know, here is Intrepid Fox by Freddie Hubbard. I don't know that tune. That's such a jazz, you know, name. Freddie is a, a jazz guy, right? Um, and then, let me see if I can find House of Jade, Wayne Shorter. These are, these are um, tunes you may not recognize, but then here's one note samba that a lot of people know. <laughs> Samba, you know, just the beauty of flipping open a book and playing a tune you've been through before. So, one more time, I'm Bradley So Wash. If you're just joining us today, we're talking about how to choose a fake book. And so far, we've covered the ultimate colossal fake books, and we've hit um, the real book, the most used jazz fake book. So, moving on from there, and as you try to figure out what fake book suits your playing or teaching needs, you can then look at fake books which are organized by genre um, or by gig, by settings. So this, this little old white Christmas fake book containing over 150 songs is well worn because every year I play a bunch of, um, you know, family and uh, Christmas tunes. Anybody who's gigging throws a Christmas tune or two in around around Christmas time. So here I just open to have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let's do that again. Ah. What a pretty song. Etc. So, um, speaking of Christmas tunes, I'm teaching a class that starts on September 3rd. Eight classes on how to jazzify Christmas tunes. And it's called Cool Yule on the Piano Stool, where we're going to jazz up well-known Christmas tunes, both sacred and secular. And it's kind of almost an arranging course because we're learning along the way how to take 
from you know something that's just a tune and turn it into a personal arrangement where we don't even all play it the same way. Um, so I invite you to take a look at that. It's bradleysowash.com, and um, it starts next week. So we're, we're, you're going to want to hop on board if you're into to playing, you know, Christmas tunes. Uh, let, let's just do one more in here just to show the utility of this. Suppose I, um, um, oh, here's Oh Christmas Tree, right? All right, that one I know by heart, so. Ah! So we're gonna hit stuff like that in that course. Um, so obviously, if you're on a Christmas gig, a collection of Christmas tunes is gonna be handy, or at least in any gig in, de in December. Here's another one I picked up later, because again, no book's gonna have all the copyrighted tunes. It's a different publisher. This is called the Ultimate Christmas Fake Book. And um, it had a few tunes in it that people were requesting that are more modern, you know, more from recent movies, things like that, that um, I didn't have. Um, so, Maybe you do a lot of weddings. So here's a wedding songbook, you know. I haven't found this particularly useful, but it has some of those, some of those uh, tunes you would use in a wedding. Um, this one I'll just share with you. This is by my friend Scott Houston. He got the rights to just a mixture of Christmas tunes and favorites. It's the closest book, actually, to um, something that you can use just by itself as a, an adult, fairly accomplished player. Um, in that the tune collection is uh, is all tunes that that you would recognize. Um, but when I say fairly accomplished player, this could this is more like a, a late beginner book because he took the the tunes and put them all in comfortable keys, and then he provided the chords above in little chord diagrams. So if you're new to fake books, this one called Favorites and Holiday Songs Fake Book. It's just a good collection of um, well, favorites and holiday songs, it's, it, and it's kind of well thought through. So, um, pretty skinny, not enough for to be comprehensive, but enough to get you started. Um, so you play a lot of church gigs, right? So I, I play. I shouldn't call them church gigs. I guess if you're a church pianist, you maybe you don't call it a gig. But when I visit a church, I'm usually a guest. So I found this very helpful, the hymn fake book, and it has all these hymns that would be uh, hard for me to improvise and arrange if I saw them written out with SATB or the four parts usually see in a, in a um, hymn book. So um, by just having the melody and chords, it allows me to sort of make up my own thing and re-envision the, the tune, reimagine the tune. And I've used this, relied on this very extensively for, uh, gosh, I've made three, four CDs of hymns um, and, and I have tons of sheet music for church pianists that are my jazz arrangements of, um, you know, hymns. Here's, here's a hymn, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. I just randomly opened it. So there's not a lot of flavor there. I would, of course, then start to work with it. Today has a, a kind of a slow 9-8 shuffle in a gospel feel. That's what I just threw to that. So if you play hymns and you know your chords and you're frightened by reading a bunch of um, notes, uh, this is a great way to just play your chords and your melody. You can lead a congregation. You can lead a band. And this has really been an important book for me. Um, let's just hit this one now. If you are a uh, classical musician, classically trained, I like to call my friends recovering classical pianists. And they, um, that just means that they have wonderful technique and great training. But unfortunately, along with classical music comes some scars about over-perfectionism. I like to say, try to avoid being paralyzed by perfection. And so with all those notes, there, there's that. And the way we're trained as classical players, we have to do it exactly the way the notes 
show it. We want to do it just right. So to get around that, I find that this is really helpful for reluctant classical players. The great composer's fake book, right? So I did bookmark this one. It won't be random. Totally transparent here. But let's say you're in a ballet class and they're doing this little... Um, at the bar, they're doing this jumping, up, jumping around with this... Um, I don't remember what it's called. Petit Allegro. Um, and so I, here's Schubert's uh, moment musicale. It just has the melody and some chords. I know you can't see that, but um, so I could fake this. Uh, ba -ba -da -da -da. You can hear how that would be useful in a ballet class. And um, we, it also underlines that, that the great composers were doing the same thing that jazz musicians or any musician does in that ever since about late baroque we've been thinking about chords and melody and how they go together i'm going to turn this tune um into something that is more of a rock and roll thing you know um show you a few more. Um, a lot of people call for Broadway tunes out on a gig. So there's um, right here I have three Broadway tune books. Um, these are more like the older Broadway tunes, not not like, you know, um, Rent or, or, or uh, Hamilton or more things like that. These are more like Music Man and yeah, Camelot and things like that. So the new Broadway fake book, the ultimate Broadway fake book, there's that hyperbole again, back page missing. Um, when I put this together yesterday, going through my books, I was thinking, which ones do I use the most? And it became apparent that the ones that were missing covers and pages and beat all up, that they'd been out on a lot of gigs. Um, the Beatles fake book has been a go-to. I taught a Beatles jazz piano class last year. This was very helpful for that. Beatles have become almost like folk music in that almost everybody can sing a great number of those tunes. So, or remember it, or um, people like Beatles. So this is just the collection of pretty much every tune that the Beatles wrote. And you can see that I have my bookmarks there. Um, and that's just a good one to grab to, um, to bring a <laughs> contemporary flavor to your playing if, if the Beatles are still contemporary. There are kids' fake books too for teachers. Another one that Scott Houston put together. Um, Scott Houston is, can be a controversial figure in some people's minds, but he's done... Uh, a very great job about getting pianists in the door to be more deeply interested in music by teaching adult beginners how to play chords and melodies. So he's done some good for our, our um, definitely done some good for our music educational world. And he put together a book called Fake Books for Kids. And he just had a great idea on this in that he made great big diagram, chord diagrams, great big print. And um, it's just a collection of, of tunes for kids. It's short and sweet. Um, this one, I'll just share with you, I've really relied on this. 1,000 jumbo tunes. This was given to me by a teacher um, back in the days when people taught music right in the elementary school classroom. And I like use this all the way through my Creative Chords um, keyboard improvisation method for beginners. It's just a collection of lead sheets and little illustrations for songs that, at least back in the day, like This Old Man... When the Saints Go Marching In, um, Goosey Goosey Gander, Oh Where Oh Where Has My Little Dog Gone, I'm just hitting these. Um, little songs that you could sing with children, younger children. And um, uh, this has just been so helpful as I used many of these tunes in my, in my writing and arranging of children's music. Um, so as long as we're on genre, I know I digress. Let me just show you some other funny ones I have. This is really going through the Bradley's library here. Here's an international collection of tunes. Um, so it's divided by Mexican and, um, uh, let's just see here, uh, Croatian, Canadian, Bosnian, Israeli. It's just, if you're out on a, I don't know, maybe you're playing a Jewish uh, wedding and you need some, some um, Israeli tunes, or maybe you're playing, uh, just somebody asked for... Um, something with a south of the border flavor. Um, here's a tune, I looked at this yesterday. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish. Jarabe Tapatio, <laughs> it's probably wrong. But what is this gonna be? So let's see. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we would know this as the Mexican hat dance. So um, it, this was its original version. So if you're doing, if you're into um, diversity or or playing unusual gigs and international fake books, they have it for everything there. This is I play Irish whistle and and uh, mandolin. And before the virus, we were playing a lot of um, get-togethers with other musicians that play Irish music. So here is Neil's Music of Ireland. You know, this huge foot, thick book, and it's nothing but fiddle tunes, um, just the melody. Um, page after page after page, thousands of tunes. So when somebody says, let's play the sheep on the mountains, I had a reference to figure that out. And also the Fiddler's Fake Book, even if you're a pianist. It's a very nice collection of old-timey tunes and tunes that, that fiddlers love. Um, and so I play a little bit of fiddle, and um, this has been invaluable for that. All right, the last bit I'm going to talk about, if I can stretch you out a little bit, was, um, oh, I just saw that question. What was the name of the International Fake Book? I don't even know where I got this. It's the Pinewoods International Collection. The Pinewoods International Collection. Um, so back to, to jazz, I just want to touch a, on a few other jazz fake books and we'll get you out of here. Um, in that there are some other ones that have become available since I was coming up that have been useful. And I'll just share those with you. Um, this is called the Jazz Fake Book, just the Jazz Fake Book. And it is um, just covers some of the tunes that were never in the real book. And um, I'm, The Lady is a Tramp, Lullaby of Birdland. I'm looking at some of these on the back. They may be in there, but... Um, and they, ha they have some problems in that it's, in my opinion, it's very small print. Um, even as a young guy, it was hard to see this in a dark room. And, um, and frankly, the chords are typically what the publishers publish with the chords, which usually are kind of wrong in terms of what people actually play. Um, but I still found it useful to fill in the, the holes that the real book did not um, cover. So that can be a, a, a supplement. And then... There's a wonderful company called the Chuck Schur Company, S-H-E-R, and I don't have a cover on this anymore. They realized that there was a hole in the, in the music publishing world and that they, jazz musicians needed practical, useful tunes, and they put together fake books, and then they even put together fake books organized by genre. Um, and these are wonderfully edited. They have huge, I just random page here, they have huge print. Um, that you can see on the gig. The chords are intelligent and, and what people actually play. Um, and it's, this is just called um, The New Real Book, Volume 1, Volume 2, right? I played a lot of gigs with these. Um, and, and then, eventually, Volume 3. And now they have a whole library of, of Chuck Schur, um, um, Schur Music Company, that are very well edited and they include some inspirational pictures of jazz musicians and things like that. So if you're a jazzer, you definitely need the real book. And these are great supplements to go a little further. I'm going to show you one more. A lot of people um, are interested in what we call jazz chords. I jazz chord you up to say I love you. Bad joke. I jazz chord. Anyway, um, so where the book might show these chords, all the things you are. A jazzer might actually play this. Right here. So, lots of colors, little changes. Um, and those are called chord substitutions. There's just subtle changes that work, but have a, more of that beautiful thing that only pianists can do so well, which is modify and shade the chords, something I love to teach. And so Dick Hyman is the, is the highly respected jazz pianist. Here's a picture of him. And he is a um, chameleon, if you will, of jazz. He can play the entire history of jazz piano uh, playing in any style and dissect it and, and work with it. He's, he's a, one of those rare musicians. Most jazz musicians are idiosyncratic in that they play the way they play. So Thelonious Monk sounds like Thelonious Monk all the time, no matter what tune he's playing. Um, Bill Evans, with his rich harmonies and his touch, has a Bill Evans sound. But um, Dick Hyman is a mus more like a classical player in that he can emulate so many of these um, eras of jazz. 
And so he put together this book called The Professional Chord Changes and Substitutions to 100 Tunes. And that got me on to thinking about what jazz players actually play. So let me just find one here. Let's, let's pick out a tune here that I would recognize. The thing is, it has um, perforated pages that you could play out and put out, play on gigs. And then these, these uh, I pulled out all the ones that I most enjoy already. So let's just see. Uh, these are all the ones I don't know. Uh, oh, I see Round Midnight. That might be a little obscure here. Let's see. Um, uh, I don't know. Let's do Round Midnight. So what you see here is a mix of black ink and red ink. The black is what the publisher wrote, and, and the red ink is what people often play. So in this case, the, the publisher said it goes like this. <laughs> And then he puts what a jazz player might do. New chord. New chord. New chord. And you can hear how those are rich and different. So they, he provides these variations where you can play, you know, the publisher's version and then, and then go back and play the, um, some changes to give it a variation on a repeat that are substitute chords. I thought that was very interesting and I learned a lot about how to find those substitute chords in my own arranging from this book. So I've got here an empty pile, an empty bookshelf and a huge pile of books on the floor. I won't bend the camera down, but it literally comes up to my knee, including not even including the one still sitting on the piano. So I've got, you know, I don't know, 30 fake books here. And that begs the question of, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna go buy 30 fake books in this review? of what's available. And I would say that what you want to do is purchase or find the book that suits your setting, your goals, and your genre. The reason I have a knee-high stack of books is that I'm a musician who plays in churches, out in society gigs, jazz clubs, uh, teacher. Uh, I, I, I play in so many environments on so many different instruments that it takes a library for me to, to get it out there. These days, I use the app called iRealPro, I-R-E-A-L-P-R-O, which shows me just the chords, which is usually enough for me. I don't need the whole fake book anymore because I know so many of these melodies already. That's just another alternative as a way to get your hands on um, a lot of tunes. iRealPro, I've done two sessions on that in the past, so I won't talk about it. So by, to conclude, the fake book that, you, that suits you it depends on the level. Is it for children? Is it for beginning improvisers? The style that you're interested in, or genre, let's call it. Is it jazz? Is it folk songs? Is it Irish music? Is it church music? And the setting in which you plan to play it. So if you're playing a lot of quiet, you know, weddings and, and quiet background music where people are, 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 you know, sort of a emotional time, then you're going to want to have a collection of ballads or, or tunes appropriate for that. And if you're playing raucous, you know, settings, maybe you need a rock and roll fake book that has, that has all the, the Beatles tunes and everything else in there. So the question is, you, you just want to, the answer is you want to find the fake book that suits your needs. And if you're a teacher you want, I, and you're interested in jazz, it's just expected that jazz players would know most of the tunes in the original fake book, the, the less obscure tunes. It's, that's the set of tunes people play just for the, from the oddity of that fake book becoming available through a grassroots way. Those tunes became the most known tunes, and um, that's how it works. So I'm going to play this out, just have a little fun as I usually do. If those of you who are here enjoy this, I encourage you to share and like it, um, and make sure you set up your Facebook page by going to the settings and making sure that I can notify you so you receive notifications by liking Bradley Sowash music page. So you can get next month's free tip of the month um, and you'll be notified about that. Um, so I'll just play it out on a standard. If you wanna just hear a little jam, and I wouldn't, for some reason, all the things you are is in my mind, the drum current tune, so I'll do some more of that.
So, until next time, enjoy your creative music making journey. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. See you around.